Hello everyone, I wanted to welcome you to Staying Power, Psychological Solutions for Your Plant-Based Journey. Um, my name is Kate McGoy-Smith and tonight, today's topic we're talking about food and feelings connection and I wanted to talk to you about it in a very different way. Um, we often talk, think about a food and our association with food, but I wanted to um, our association, sorry, we talk about feelings and our association with food. And I wanted to talk about it on another whole level. I had, uh, this month, we've been talking about the theme of stories. And so we have stories around food for sure, because it's a very hot topic to say the least. And I wanted to um, address that with you. But just as we begin, again, just to welcome you, and we welcome people from close and far away. I'm here in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and we hope that you'll join us. Um, my name again is Kate McGoy-Smith, and I'm a former registered nurse. I've worked both in the operating room and at the bedside, as well as in the community. And then I did a master's in clinical social work and have practiced for 25 years in that area of looking at family therapy, addictions, and um, uh, relationship issues. And so I'm really hoping that um, you'll join us today. And I have been on a whole plant-based journey since December 1st of 2012 and have really appreciated the health changes. And that's how ForkSmart came about. It's rooted in gratitude and we're um, propelled by passion to spread this information to you. And I'm particularly interested in um, psychological solutions that can be of help to people in the knowing, between the knowing and doing gap of, of uh, making health behavior changes, especially on your plant-based journey. So I wanted to talk today about f feelings and food and the connection between the two. And I'm going to approach it a little differently. In Earlier in the month, I talked about just sometimes um, a person, a situation, or even a, a particular um, memory of something strikes is associated with food. For example, if you go to the movie theater... Maybe you automatically think, uh, I've got to have some popcorn. That uh, popcorn is uh, just something that is immediately associated with sitting, enjoying a movie. Um, and Or if you go for a walk in the summertime, you immediately think of having an ice cream cone. The heat and the warmth and just in hearing that little bell sometimes from the ice cream truck can be enough that will stimulate you uh, to have the ice cream. And if you notice what that pattern is, um, you know, and, and we see that in even in seasonal events, like with the holiday season coming up, um, some people celebrate Christmas, celebrate, other people celebrate other parts of that kind of holiday in December. And um, they may Im immediately think of certain foods like a turkey or a ham or whatever it is that they associate with um, eating uh, a holiday uh, dinner. And so all of those kind of associations we have with regard to situations or people we're with, is uh, we often invoke sometimes food. But what is the p common theme of all of that is is our desire, um, and I, I, it's kind of a propelling kind of desire, but it comes out of a, a learned behavior that we repeat over and over and over again, and that's what we call a habit. A habit is nothing more than something we've learned to do and that we have repeated consistently. Um, and so, therefore, we almost do it what we call automatic pilot. And perhaps you've had that experience where you've driven home and you're not under the influence of any kind of alcohol or drugs and you kind of land in your driveway and you go wow I, I don't even remember kind of driving home I just sort of got there I didn't have to think about it I knew where to turn I, I didn't even you know pay much attention to um, much else I was just kind of 
uh, on automatic pilot and I got home. And um, so that that is a habit. And a habit needs to sometimes be examined. And why I wanted to talk about uh, the feeling food connection, but I want to talk to you about it in a whole other different lay, way. And that is that something that really struck me that when I've had a conversation with Dr. Esselstyn, he's talked about that, you know, they say the two most difficult things to um, talk about that create a real source of conflict are religion and politics. And what's interesting is, you know, there's not just those two things, but there's really a triangle of conflict, and that's religious politics and food. And food is part of that triangle of conflict that we get into, where we sometimes just lose perspective. And uh, we lose connection with other people because people take very arbitrary stands and positions. They, their, their position is kind of within cement boots. Um, they're not willing to move off it. And so people have very strong ideas around all those three things. And I started to think about what, what is the block there from people having conversation and dialogue when it comes to any of those three topics? food, religion, and um, and um, politics. And how is it that we get really backed into certain corners and in cement boot positions and we don't kind of move and we don't really stop, we stop listening and therefore without listening we, we can't have understanding because we can't hear a different perspective. And the sort of common sort of theme with regard to that is that I believe that there's primary and secondary harm that's been done. And what I mean by that is if we just, let's take a look at food. For example, primary hurt that can be done with regard to food is that um, it could be something as as you were growing up. Perhaps, you know, you, you um, fell and hurt, hurt yourself and you bruised your knee or scraped it. And you go inside and you say to your mom or dad, like, oh, I really hurt my knee. It's, it's, and you're crying and you're upset. And as they comfort you, they also say, well, oh, it'll be better. Look, let's get some milk and cookies and you'll feel better. Um, let's give you some, let's have an ice cream after that. And you think about the type of things that happen with regard to that. So that primary sort of feeling around that with food is, okay, um, instead of me talking out my feelings, may, maybe I've come home and I've just broken up with a, a, a friend, a boyfriend or girlfriend, I'm really upset. You know, what do we end up doing? Let's have the cookie dough ice cream. And um, we end up stuffing, in a sense, our feelings. We end up squishing them. And people, in a way of trying to comfort us, instead of putting their arms around us and talking it through and just even listening, just just being there with an empathic ear to say, you know, this must be really hard. It sounds like you're very disappointed. Um I know this is really hurting right now. Is instead they're going, hey, let's let's go out, let's have a drink, let's go have some ice cream, let's go, um, you know, have a chocolate bar, let's let's do something else like that, and we end up actually just sort of really stuffing those feelings down inside us, and that's that kind of primary experience we have with associations with feelings and food, is that food is there to kind of put a cork in our feelings, that it's going to try to make everything better. It's kind of going to band-aid over all of that stuff when we know underneath there's that wounding that's going on. And so then there's that secondary one where we hear it in our family. You know, we hear associations with food. For example, many people can recount stories of a parent 
particularly moms, unfortunately. A lot of women are caught in the whole diet cycle. And as a result, everybody in the family is suddenly having to have the cottage cheese or the grapefruits or this has changed or we can't have this. And so food becomes a kind of act of control um, and that we're all sort of suffering from. And so we end up feeling that, that's a secondary kind of feeling. Like the food's a real problem, that food's something that we have to be guarded against because it can cause us harm or we have to actually sort of, um, or it can ha cause us harm by either eating it or cause us harm by we having to eat it. You know, like I have to have that cottage cheese that I hate. I have to have those grapefruits that I can't stand. Or I'm going to go on the watermelon diet or whatever new kind of fad diet is along. And so we have both primary experience and secondary experience. So I'm sure there are lots of, if we thought about our story around uh, messages that we get about food, we have them from a secondary point of view, like, hey, you know, what do you mean you're not going to finish your plate? There are kids starving in other uh, other places in the world that would would just love to have this food. So you've got to eat every single morsel. And if you notice those kind of messages, whether they come from a secondary experience by family uh, dynamics and, and what's happening in our family right at that moment, our family belief system about how every plate should be a clean plate, we should all clean everything off. Um, there's no snacking in between meals. There's, um, you know, no dessert unless you eat your main course. Those kind of big mega messages that we get, um, those secondary messages that we hear in our family, and also then the primary ones about how we ourselves interact directly with food of, you know, have this piece of cake, you'll feel better. Have this dessert, you'll feel better. Have this ice cream, you'll feel better. That we associate, we have pro positive associations with food as it's going to make us feel better. Um, and so therefore, if we take a look at both the primary and secondary messages around food and what's attached to them, then we're more likely to... Um, be able to have an understanding of why we have certain feelings connected with our food. So if you're just joining us right now, we're talking about the fee, food and feeling connection. And um, I can see that Carol's joining us and some other people are joining us. So thank you for doing that. And um, uh, this will also be po posted on YouTube if, if you can't be with us live. Uh, and I wanted to talk about today uh, about this food feeling connection, but on a whole other level of both primary messages we get that are directly affected by us and what we heard, but also secondary messages that we get in just growing up in our family and how people have different relationships with food. We may have a sister or brother who perhaps used food in a way to um, kind of control things by way of they they refused to eat, refused to eat certain things, and there were battles around food. And so food can be a real minefield of that triangle of conflict of, you know, sex, um, sex, religion, and politics that, you know, um, and we really... Um, get in trouble about those kind of things. And, and food can be on that triangle of um, religion and, and uh, politics, that that food triangle is part, that triangle of conflict is right there with food. And so those three things, if we think, we often get primary and secondary um, messages and experiences from that. And in that primary and secondary an underlying feeling that's really at the base of it, it's really at the core of, of often our own challenges with eating is fear. And so fear is right there of fear of disappointing or not um, agreeing with the 
rules of the family. For example, if I, you know, don't eat everything on my plate, if, um, if, uh, I want to have dessert and yet I haven't eaten my main, main course. If, uh, for example, I want to express how I'm really feeling. I may want to express my anger. I may want to scream. I want to shout or yell. I might be actually soothed into not doing any of those things by be given an ice cream cone or a piece of cake. And if you notice that food also stops us from communicating, it's very hard if and we have to have rules around it. Don't eat with your with um, don't talk with your mouth full. So if we can stuff our feelings with food, we also stop our communication as well, because it's considered rude to be talking when your mouth is uh, full of food. And so we get the message both ways. And so suddenly food is not used as a way of nourishing ourselves, but instead we end up using it as a nurturing source. And there's, that's a really confusing message for most of us. Because when we reach for food, are we really reaching for it out of the three types of hunger that I talked about last week? Are we reaching out of out of, for stomach hunger where we're actually really hungry and it's been five or six hours, our stomach is growling and we actually need to fuel up in order to be able to have the energy to continue doing our activities? Or is it that mouth hunger where we have that sensation and we actually get soothed by that sensation of maybe creaminess um, or something salty it, that it we, it's almost like that sort of craving aspect that we want something to satisfy ourselves. But and then there's also the heart hunger where it's just that feeling of, you know, I'm upset about something. I want to be comforted. And we go for the nurturing that food provides because we have all these associations. And that's what gets me back to my message today is feelings and food connection. Let's look at the primary and secondary sources of those connections. The primary source is the messages we get ourselves with regard to when we are eating something and why we were given that to eat it. Is it because we were upset at the time and it's seen as a way of comforting us? Is it a way of distracting us from what's really going on um, that we don't end up getting to assert ourselves? That instead, I will sort of distract you by giving you a piece of cake to have instead? Uh, or are there secondary messages that we get as well and with regard to, you know, this is when we grew up, clean everything off your plate, can't have anything until you eat everything so you can have dessert. There are starving children in the world, so that's another motive to be able to eat everything on your plate. So we think about those secondary messages um, that are important uh, and that we hear. And all of them, that primary and secondary messages, all add up to repeated behaviors which equal habits. And that's all they are, is repeated behaviors that equal habits. And habits are acts of that are familiar to us. And familiarity makes us feel safer. Uh, we feel emotionally safer when things are familiar. Um, that's why many people, for example, stay stuck. You know, they may have a complaint, but they're not necessarily prepared to make any changes in it because they're familiar with that complaint. They sort of know how to operate. They they know what to expect. When we create change, we all of a sudden create a, a, a small kind of chaos in our life. We sort of go, oh, this feels uncomfortable. It doesn't feel familiar, you know, and because that's what new habits are about. It's, it's about creating um new activities that um, end up becoming eventually routines and habits. So it's 
it's a really possible and I guess that's the exciting thing. It's actually possible to say, okay, I've done this repeated behavior. I'm getting stuck in it. I now recognize that when I go to eat, I may not be eating out of hunger. I may be eating out of soothing my feelings, distracting me from my feelings, uh, not accepting my feelings, um, avoiding my feelings, so that therefore I can sort of continue on my way, but I'm really off goal. I'm off track because my goal is to eat healthy, be a, of a healthy weight, uh, have overall health, uh, lower cholesterol, lower blood pressure, um, regular sugar levels, um, those kind of things that I, that I can actually perform during the day, that I can actually go for a walk and not be exhausted from it, uh, that I can do my daily routine without being totally fatigued by the end of the day, um, that I still have energy to do me time and uh, personal things that I'd like to pursue. And so therefore, when we, um, when we recognize that we are going to be customers for change, then we're more likely to say, I think it's possible to look at this habit of, for example, my eating and notice that what kind of feelings, what kind of, you know, if I did almost an inventory of what are the kind of primary sources that messages am I getting? What are the secondary sources I'm getting with regard to the food choices I'm making and making them at that particular time? with those particular people in this particular situation, then I am more likely to consider perhaps making a swap out and saying, I want to change this. I want to not still feel stuck. I don't want to stay with this complaint. I want it to leave me. And I think that is the challenge for all of us that we want to have a chance to look at that. So as as I read a kind of recap and I give you a challenge for homework is that this week try noticing try noticing every time you pick up a piece of food just stop for a moment and say to yourself am I eating this for fuel or is it out of feeling? Fuel or feeling. And if it's feeling then ask yourself, do I get, what's the primary message here or what's the secondary message that I got around this food? What does that food remind me of? Does that remind me of its comfort that, hey, my mom would give me a cookie every time, you know, I was upset with something or I had that ice cream and I'd, ah, uh, I could remember the beach or I remember a happy feeling and a memory and it would take me away from, it would distract me away from my current situation and my current stressor. So I would really ask you to challenge yourself to see that we get primary and secondary messages around food and feelings and be able to be more aware of that. Just the practice of, no, of noticing is extremely powerful for us to make the next step to doing something about it. So that, give yourself some time to be doing some noticing, have some honest dialogue with yourself because underneath all of those feelings is there sort of a nucleus of fear, a fear of, you know, how will I handle those feelings if I don't have food to comfort me, uh, to distract me, to help me avoid something? Um, will I fall apart? Um, will there be no one around to help comfort me? And so just being able to have that honest dialogue with yourself because no one knows you better than you yourself or I, right? The three of you can gang up on the other and really kind of face this. And this, these are hard conversations to have with, with yourself However, they're so worthy and you are so worthy of those conversations because you have every right to be able to fuel yourself, enjoy the fuel, be pleasured by the fuel, 
but not have the consequence of being um, have uh, the consequence of feeding feelings that do get you off goal, off track, and lead to ill health. You, no one deserves that, and you don't deserve that. And so you deserve to have fuel that's pleasurable, that you enjoy at that at that time, and gives you energy in order to participate fully in your day and evening, and so that you have health, and that your health is not harmed, that you are vibrant in your health and have energy in your health, because you are choosing foods that will fuel you, but also can be very pleasurable. And they don't have, those don't have to be mutually exclusive. We can find very pleasurable foods um, in the whole plant-based world that can be um, very tantalizing and at the same time fuel us for the energy that we deserve and need to get through our day. So I'm going to encourage you to take a look, to do your noticing this week. Notice where the food feeling connection is for you. Is it at the primary source or a secondary source? And what does that mean? And can you tackle some of that fear? Um, and that you can reach out to other people for the support you need, for the nurturing you need, and do also some self-nurturing. And then together next week, we will have a chance to talk further about um, our food stories. And I look forward to um, having you join us then. And I want to thank all the people, Carolyn, Janine, and uh, Arlene, and any others that were able to join us today. And uh, please know that um, uh, ForkSmart and myself, Kate McGoy-Smith, our whole desire is for you to find your full, vibrant self uh, in this experience and know that you're never alone. And look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.